Chapter 12 The Silver Star April 19, 1968 0630 hours LZ Sally TOC Command Bunker Colonel John H. Cushman, 47 years old, with the stalking presence of a born leader, stands in front of a map addressing Captain Holland and a large group of his airborne officers. Inside the bunker, Flaherty stands next to Lencioni. The two men have worked several missions together since the gun incident, and neither one has said a word about it. In Vietnam, such exchanges quickly pale to insignificance. Cushman continues his briefing. With the successful ending of Operation Carrington, we will now be commencing with Carrington II. However, your units were specifically chosen to conduct Operation Delaware. Your primary mission will be to block enemy supply routes, exiting the Asha Valley as they head towards Wei. Cushman points to several marked areas of his map and adds, We'll be setting up blocking forces here, off to the east, with 1st and 4th platoons. Lieutenant Lencioni, with 2nd platoon, and my 1-meter Lieutenant Mr. Flaherty, with 3rd, will link up and support those platoons as you move toward the Asha Valley. April 19, 1968, 08.30 hours, Chua Tien Province. An army platoon resembling a giant green boa constrictor stealthily snakes its way in a single file line through the thick jungle. The terrain that morning dictated the formation. However, on most patrols, Flaherty preferred utilizing an arrowhead formation with a left and right flank. The head of the serpent is led by the point man. Being asked to walk point can be the highest honor or worst punishment, depending on who you ask. His responsibility is to walk headlong into hostile territory, searching for the enemy and his traps. Drenched in sweat, the point man, Mike Nunez, keeps his head on a swivel, scanning every inch of jungle in front of him. His nose picks up the slightest wisp of a foreign scent, wafting above the rotting vegetation, and his body automatically freezes. The rest of the serpent comes to a halt, coiled and ready to strike. Walking behind the point man is the slack man, whose responsibility is to check for anything the point man might have missed. Nunez turns to the slack man and whispers, Fitz, up ahead! Fitz scans the jungle, looking for movement or any shape or color that doesn't blend in. I don't see anything, Fitz whispers back. Nunez nods his head, indicating the way forward. Someone was just smoking a cigarette. The jungle erupts into a fiery orange explosion of AK-47 and rocket-propelled grenade fire. An RPG round detonates on a tree just feet from Nunez, instantly shredding him to pieces. The line falls back as the incoming fire increases tenfold. RPG rockets whoosh through the air, cutting through swaths of jungle. The rockets impact onto the larger trees, causing thunderous explosions that rain shrapnel and debris onto the platoon as they hunker deeper into the muddy jungle floor. Flaherty runs forward as bullets whiz by, diving behind a downed tree next to Fitz. Where's Nunes? He's... he's... Fitz is trying to process what just happened to his good friend. Flaherty, trying to snap him out of it, interrupts. Come on, Fitz, get your head in the game! He's everywhere! They blew him to bits! Okay, Fitzy, you're the spear tip now. No one gets by you. If we don't start flanking them, they'll mow us all down! The incoming fire continues to probe their position. Flaherty removes three grenades from his vest and puts them down next to Fitz. Flaherty roughly grabs Fitz's arm, making sure he has his full attention, and adds, Every 30 seconds, lob one, and conserve your ammo to short bursts! Fitz nods his head. Flaherty, in a low crawl, heads back towards the rest of his men. As he continues to edge toward his RTO, two rocket-propelled grenades whiz over his head. Kaboom! A third RPG explodes against a tree just in front of Flaherty, lifting him airborne and spinning him like a top. As his helmet flies off his head, Flaherty is momentarily knocked unconscious. He awakens to sharp pain. A sliver of metal shrapnel is burning into the top of his skull, causing blood to flow freely down his face. RTO Orlando Lewis grabs Flaherty by the sleeve and drags him behind a log. Lewis sees the small piece of shrapnel and gently pulls it out of Flaherty's head. LT, are you okay? Flaherty is experiencing blurred vision and a loud buzzing sound in his ears. Lewis's voice is muffled, distant. What? Flaherty asks, not even able to hear his own voice. LT, are you all right? No response. Medic! I need a medic! Lewis screams. 
The buzzing starts to subside, and Flaherty's eyes begin to refocus. As the sounds of violent assault start to flood his ears again, Flaherty answers, I'm fine, I'm fine, no medic! Did you call in the contact? Done! They're working on an artillery firing position! Lewis ducks into the dirt as another RPG whooshes over them. Good job! Until that arty starts coming in, we need to put some pressure on their right flank. I think we hit a fortified bunker. Flaherty leaves Lewis and runs over to Sergeant Hawkins. Bullets, like angry wasps, follow him, trying to extract their revenge. Where's my arty? He barks over his shoulder. I need that bunker taken out! Hawkins buries his head momentarily into the dirt as several AK-47 rounds zing past, then answers. First and second platoon are getting clobbered. They're using all of the artillery to keep from being overrun. Flaherty fires a volley of M-16 rounds, turns to Hawkins and says, Shit! Okay, sit tight! Flaherty crawls towards several of his soldiers holding the front line. He motions to three of the men, positioning himself behind a large, downed tree. Griggs, Escobar, Brody, fall back to my position! The three soldiers nod. Flaherty slaps in a fresh magazine and shouts, Cover fire! While letting loose a long volley. The three young soldiers move faster than they ever crawled in boot camp, making record time slinking their way over to Flaherty. Flaherty stops firing and turns to the men. We have no fire support, and that bunker is chewing us up. He points to a raised berm 20 yards forward. I'm going to advance to that berm. You see it? All three men see the berm. They nod and whisper collectively. Yes, sir. Jimmy, I want you to grab O'Meara's 90mm rifle. Do you know how to fire it? Jimmy Brody nods yes. Okay, good man. O'Mara's back there getting his leg patched up. His fire team is KIA. Once I draw their fire, you get in my position by that tree stump and let go with a round every ten seconds. After a couple rounds, make sure to let it cool for a few minutes or you'll cook the rounds off in the tube. Grab Sykes and have him carry the ammo and load for you. Brody nods and says, Got it. He turns on his heel and sprints towards the inner perimeter. Flaherty continues with, Guys, as Jimmy's launching rounds at the bunker, I want you to flank them to the east. Head off to that bomb crater and wait till you see me make my charge. Griggs and Escobar stealthily slide on their stomachs over 30 yards to the east and wait for Flaherty. Brody runs up to Flaherty, shouldering a large and heavy recoilless rifle that looks similar to a World War II bazooka. Sykes, his loader, comes behind him holding a big satchel of ammo. Jimmy, if you get a direct hit, watch out for Griggs and Escobar. They'll roll up to the bunker if they get the opportunity. Ready? Fucking A! Okay, boys, here we go. Flaherty takes off in a sprint, heading just west of the bunker. Immediately, all the machine gun fire from the bunker is aimed towards him. Bullets chew up the ground near Flaherty's quick-moving feet. A bullet strikes the heel of his boot, knocking him to the ground. Flaherty quickly scrambles upright, limping as he sprints the last ten yards to the tree line. Brody shoulders the large rifle tube. With Sykes on his heels, carrying the ammo, he runs straight up the middle hunkering down behind the huge tree stump. In a heavy sweat, Flaherty makes it behind a tree and immediately starts firing three-round bursts at the bunker. All enemy fire is now concentrated on Flaherty. The loud boom of the recoilless rifle is immediately followed by its round exploding near the enemy bunker. The explosion doesn't knock out the bunker, but launches a large cloud of dirt and debris into the air. Griggs and Brody sprint towards the east side of the bunker. The tree Flaherty is using as cover is getting shredded by the withering machine gun fire. Debris from the tree is knocked into Flaherty's eyes. He's temporarily blinded. Griggs and Escobar watch the bunker, waiting for their opportunity to launch their attack. Brody fires off another round, a direct hit to the bunker's front-facing sandbag wall. Griggs and Escobar use the opportunity to take off in a full sprint towards the smoldering bunker, firing from the hip as they run. They kill several now-stunned NVA manning the machine gun inside the bunker. Two other NVA soldiers try to sneak away by crawling through a rear trench. Griggs shoots the legs of the first man, and the other immediately throws down his AK-47 and surrenders. Flaherty finally clears the debris from his red and swollen eyes. Looking up, he sees Griggs and Escobar walking behind two NVA soldiers. The prisoners have their hands up. One of the NVA is wounded badly and is having trouble walking. Griggs says over his shoulder to Escobar, Cover him and I'll drag this dink back. Griggs hands his rifle to Escobar and walks to the wounded man. The wounded NVA is bent over in pain, blood flowing down his legs. No! Flaherty screams in warning. 
As Griggs tries to grab the wounded man's shirt, the man pulls a small knife from his boot, plunging it deep into Griggs' stomach. Running towards the men, Flaherty expertly places a well-grouped three-round burst into the knife-wielding NVA's chest, instantly dropping him. The other NVA soldier turns his body towards Flaherty, who without hesitation drops the man with one clean shot to the head. Escobar grabs Griggs, who is holding his stomach, trying to stop the flow of blood. Flaherty barks, Get him back to the dock! Then he shouts to all the men in his vicinity, From now on, until I say different, we don't take prisoners! As Flaherty and his three men work their way back towards their defensive perimeter, hundreds of NVA sprint through the jungle towards them. April 19, 1968, 1445 hours. LZ Sally, TOC Command Bunker. Colonel Cushman, Captain Holland, and several other officers are crowded around a radio. Lieutenant Lencioni, covered in dirt and blood, runs into the tent and asks Holland, Sit rep, sir. Holland, understanding Lencioni's grave concern, ignores the flagrant violation of a junior officer asking a senior officer for a sit rep and shakes his head. You and 1st Platoon were the last to make it out before the trap was sprung. Flaherty's platoon and 4th Platoon are completely surrounded. The last report is three KIAs and 15 WIAs. Any gunships in the area? That's a negative, Lieutenant. Almost all air support is tasked for Operation Carrington, and already several units have engaged stiff resistance in Dong Ha. Holland walks over to the war map and draws a circle surrounded by X's. He starts explaining to Lencioni, bringing him up to speed. Fourth platoon leader is KIA. Flaherty was able to fight his way over to them and consolidated the two platoons. He's just finishing setting up the defensive perimeter. We're working on logistics for a resupply airdrop. Lencioni shakes his head, saying, That perimeter is too small, and the jungle canopy is too thick for an airdrop. We'd be just giving them away to the enemy. April 19, 1968 1,500 hours, to Etienne province. Flaherty is limping back and forth, placing men into different firing positions. Constant AK-47 fire pours in from all directions, making it even more difficult to move the men. After Flaherty finishes his placements, he hobbles back towards their makeshift triage area for the wounded. More than 15 of his men are either unconscious or heavily bleeding. One medic is feverishly working on the injured. Time is running out. We gotta get these men out of here. April 19th, 1968. 1615 hours. TOC command bunker. Cushman turns to Holland. The LZ's too hot for an extraction. They're gonna have to gut it out till morning. They won't last the next few hours out there, Holland replies. Lencioni turns to Holland, points at the map, and adds, Have the choppers insert my platoon back onto this ridge. We'll hump and fight our way over to them. That's a no-go, and even if we had air support, that would be a suicide mission. I can't risk losing any more men. Lencioni asks, Why aren't they working the arty? A small group, possibly a squad of men from 4th, got trapped somewhere outside the perimeter, answers another captain. Lencioni stares at the map in frustration. Damn it! April 19th, 1968. 18.30 hours. Tuatien Province. Several of Flaherty's men are working to set up claymore mines and tripwires just outside the perimeter. Inside the perimeter, the men are making last-minute efforts to dig in and create some type of fighting holes. By the time they're finished, the last of the day's light is gone. Night, with its unseen terrors, has come. Flaherty is talking into the radio handset. Juliet 6, I copy. We'll hold tight. He hangs up the receiver and runs to his makeshift triage location. Surrounded by large, downed trees in a natural depression, it's the safest area inside the perimeter. Flaherty checks with his medic, who is still frantically working on recently hit Sergeant King. King was a salty lifer who had served in Korea and was on his third tour in Vietnam. He was hit after the third time he valiantly rushed outside the perimeter to retrieve fallen men. King going down was an enormous blow to the platoon's morale. Most believed he was the man that would get them all home safe. After hours of constant incoming fire, the intensity of the enemy barrage starts to ebb, with only sporadic crackling from the AK-47s. Flaherty looks around, sensing something is wrong. What he doesn't see 
are six Viet Cong dressed in their black pajamas, stealthily snaking their way on their stomachs towards Flaherty's perimeter. The NVA expertly locate and cut the Claymore mines and trip flare wires left on the perimeter by the Americans. Over a hundred VC and NVA soldiers silently start inching their way forward. Flaherty goes over to his main defensive line. The bulk of his platoon is positioned here, based on the area's topography. He starts to address the men. They're about to hit us hard again. I can feel it. I want everyone... Flaherty hears screaming behind him. He turns to see three of his men struggling to hold down another soldier. Flaherty rushes over to the commotion. What the hell is going on? The frantic soldier is Joseph Cummings. He stops struggling when he sees Flaherty approach. The M60 gunner, Louis Fernandez, who is straddling Cummings, gets off him, but still grips him tightly by his uniform jacket. Fernandez turns to Flaherty. Cummings flipped out after King went down. He's not making any sense, and he says we gotta surrender. The other two soldiers loosen their grip on Cummings' limbs as Cummings' breathing starts to slow. Flaherty takes off his helmet and kneels in front of Cummings. Joe, I need every man that can fight on that line. There is no surrender. You got that? Cummings stares blankly at Flaherty. Flaherty takes a few breaths and calmly adds, Son, I need you to hold it together. When we're out of the bush, I will personally make sure to transfer you or send you home. But for now, you will grab your rifle and you will fight. Or I will personally tie you to that tree. Flaherty points to a half-knocked-down palm tree that has absorbed numerous RPG rounds. Cummings looks around as he starts to register where he is. Vaguely, he nods his head yes to Flaherty. Flaherty slaps him on the shoulder and says, Good man. He turns to Fernandez. Give him back his rifle. Flaherty looks around at his men, seeing that Cummings' outburst has further hurt morale. A nervous look of uneasiness starts spreading like an infection. Flaherty knows how quickly fear can turn into panic. Flaherty stands up, exposing himself to danger, but showing the men he is unafraid. In a loud, assuring voice, he says, Listen up! The enemy is preparing a full-out frontal assault! hoping to overwhelm us with numbers, hoping we'll break and run. There is no place to run, and they're not here to take prisoners. We make our stand right here and right now. Flaherty pauses, and the platoon focuses on what he will say next. I promise if you do exactly what I say and rely on your training, Charlie will cut and run. We'll all make it out of here safe and sound. Now focus on your targets. Make every bullet count and make Charlie pay for every fucking inch till he can't take it no more. A look of determination floods over the men's faces as they look at each other, acknowledging their brotherhood. Just then, a soldier spots movement and fires his rifle on fully automatic. The NVA are now on their feet in a light jog, screaming their battle cry as they advance. Flaherty bends to a knee and starts firing his rifle at the numerous targets. All his men join him in a deafening symphony of death. Cummings uses the opportunity to grab a white handkerchief he had hidden in his pocket. He attaches it to his rifle, then waves the modified white flag over his head as he runs toward the enemy. Flaherty sees the man run and yells, Cummings, get back here, you son of a bitch! Two of the soldiers to Flaherty's right stop firing. Cummings is inside their field of fire. They're afraid they might hit him. Cummings dives to the ground as rounds fly over his head. Flaherty continues to knock down attackers with quick three-round bursts. He screams over the battle noise to the men next to him. If he gets up again, you will not stop firing. If he gets hit, then he gets hit. That's an order. Despite their losses, the huge enemy wave continues to crash forward. Cummings finally comes to his senses and crawls back to the platoon unharmed. The first wave of charging enemy soldiers finally stalls only 20 yards from Flaherty's line. An enemy commander, using his whistle, signals the retreat. They pull back with as many of their fallen comrades as they can grab. April 19, 1968. 2130 hours. TOC Command Bunker. Inside Colonel Cushman's command bunker, men are huddled around the radio, listening to sounds of the horrific battle going on. Cushman reads through reports and continues to issue orders. He turns to Holland and encouragingly says... They're still hanging in there. But for how much longer, Lencioni says out loud. They need to find those lost men. April 20th, 1968. 
0130 hours to Etienne province. As the enemy retreats, Flaherty shouts, Cease fire! Cease fire! The ceasefire order is passed along, shouted from man to man. Gradually, the gunfire dies down. Sounds of battle are replaced by screams of agony from the wounded and dying. Flaherty turns to Sergeant Rob Kane. We ain't gonna survive the next charge without artillery support. Send a couple men out to check our Claymore and trip flare wires, because they should have gone off in that last attack. Yes, sir, Kane responds. Next, tell them to grab the smallest dead NVA they can find and drag him back here with all his weapons and equipment. LT, you want a dead gook? You heard me, just do it. Flaherty strips off his clothes as two soldiers drag a small dead NVA soldier back into the perimeter. Kane looks at Flaherty, shaking his head in disbelief. You can't be serious. Flaherty starts removing the dead soldier's uniform. It's the one time my height will actually help. Flaherty, wearing the NVA uniform, places the NVA helmet on his head, partially obscuring his face. Kane walks over and smears mud across Flaherty's face, helping to further disguise him. Flaherty picks up the dead man's AK-47 rifle and crawls out of the perimeter towards the enemy. Ten yards out, Flaherty sees several dead NVA soldiers and grabs the nearest one. He slings the AK-47 over his shoulder and drags the dead soldier backwards by his uniform collar, heading toward the enemy lines. Looking over his shoulder, he sees several pockets of NVA soldiers wave to him, motioning him to keep dragging the man back past them. After Flaherty passes the first line of enemy lookouts, he drops the body and starts scanning for his lost men. A group of NVA are moving forward towards Flaherty. He's caught in the open. Shit! Flaherty quickly kneels and starts disassembling his AK-47 on the ground. The soldiers walk past Flaherty. The last NVA to pass him by is an officer. Cholai! He barks. Flaherty nods, keeping his head down as he starts to reassemble the rifle. The soldiers continue to move forward past the besieged American platoons. Flaherty scans the area in the darkness, making out the shape of several previously destroyed enemy bunkers. As he approaches each, he utters in a hushed voice the password, Purple Haze! Purple Haze! Inside the bunker, a dead NVA soldier starts to move. From beneath the body, a U.S. soldier cautiously peers out and whispers, Goofy Grape! Flaherty, already starting to scurry away to the next bunker, stops as he barely hears the return password. Flaherty turns back to the bunker and slowly pulls out his Buck 119 hunting knife, whispering, Purple Haze? Goofy Grape, replies the soldier again. Flaherty quickly returns his knife to its sheath and jumps into the bunker. He holds a finger up to his lips, warning the men inside to be quiet. Three soldiers push dead bodies aside and scramble towards Flaherty. One of the soldiers, with blood streaming out of his ears, loudly says, LT, we got... Flaherty motions sharply with his hands as he says, Keep it down! There's enemy less than 50 yards away! Where's the rest of the guys? The first soldier says, Follow me! The first soldier crawls out of the bunker, Flaherty and the other two men following. He leads the group 20 yards away towards an old deep artillery crater full of scattered debris. As he gets closer to the crater, he starts whispering, Purple Haze! Purple Haze! Hidden under dirt, leaves, and palm fronds, the last three soldiers slowly rise from their hidden graves. Is there anyone else? Flaherty asks the new group. The soldiers shake their heads, no. Stay on my ass! If they spot us, make a run for it! He points in a forward direction and adds, The platoon is about 150 yards over there! The seven men cautiously work their way through the jungle. Just 50 yards from their platoon, they are spotted by the NVA. One of the American soldiers is shot in the back and collapses. Go! Go! shouts Flaherty. He tries to grab his fallen comrade and is nicked in the shoulder by a bullet. One of the other soldiers tries to grab the downed man, but Flaherty waves him off. He's dead! Run! The first soldier in line running towards the platoon waves his arms about frantically, yelling, Purple Haze! Purple Haze! Several U.S. soldiers break from their perimeter, running out to help Flaherty and the five soldiers. The NVA used the opportunity to launch another large-scale attack. As soon as all the men are safely inside the perimeter, Flaherty shouts to Lewis, Start raining down that fucking artillery! The friendly thunder of giant 155 howitzers coming from Fubai starts booming. 
Artillery shells rained down onto the advancing NVA, sweeping them aside like an angry hand clearing a chessboard. April 20th, 1968, 0630 hours, to Etienne Province. Five Huey helicopters packed with soldiers fly in formation as the sun rises from the horizon. The lead chopper carries Colonel Cushman, Lencioni, and several other officers. The convoy flies over Flaherty's still smoking perimeter. The fighting is over, and their bird's eye view reveals the extent of the carnage. Lencioni sees close to a hundred dead enemy soldiers strewn in concentric rings around the perimeter. Mixed in the rings of NVA soldiers are body parts and shredded web gear, completing the gruesome display. Following protocol, Lencioni requests over the radio for someone in Flaherty's unit to pop smoke before they set their choppers down. One of Flaherty's men opens a smoke canister containing a bluish smoke. It quickly floats over the perimeter. Lencioni responds, That's affirmative. I have bikini blue. Lencioni looks down on the battlefield, this time seeing a majestic vision. The bluish smoke drifts in between long red and white strips of bloody gauze flapping off the bushes, while the sun's rays reflect and glimmer off a mound of empty sea rations and expended ammo cans. It completes the most authentic American flag he's ever laid eyes on. Cushman and Lencioni, along with a fresh platoon of soldiers, enter Flaherty's perimeter. The churned-up earth looks more like the dark side of the moon than a tropical jungle. Huge craters and baseball-sized rocks litter the area. Flaherty is sitting on an ammo box as a medic patches up his shoulder. He and his men look haggard, covered in blood and dirt. Almost every man is in a reclining position or sitting quietly in reflection. Some are smoking cigarettes. The wounded soldiers quickly receive attention from a group of medics. Once stabilized, they're placed on litters and loaded into medevac choppers, known as dust-offs, for a quick hop to the nearest medical units for more attention. Flaherty sees Lencioni first and nonchalantly says, I hope you didn't forget the coffee and donuts. Lencioni smiles and replies, Hard-nosed little bastard. Lencioni puts his arm around Flaherty and pats him on the back a couple of times. Cushman walks over to Flaherty, and he quickly stands at attention. Cushman proudly says, At ease, son. I want you to know I'm putting you in for the Silver Star. Not me, sir. My men are the ones that deserve all. Save the humility shit for the AP reporters, because the Airborne needs officers like you. I'm also having you promoted to First Lieutenant. Flaherty, without any fear, counters. I appreciate that, sir. But after this tour, I was hoping to get a shot at Special Forces School. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. My one-meter lieutenant wants to be a Green Beret. Cushman frowns for a moment, then shrugs. I could try to talk you out of it, but I know what a stubborn little prick you are. Thank you, sir, Flaherty proudly answers. For his heroism on April 20th, 1968, Lieutenant Richard Flaherty was presented with the Silver Star. It was just one of many medals, awards, and commendations he would receive. On May 17, 1968, Operation Carrington II came to an end. 140 U.S. soldiers would be listed as killed in action, 731 listed as wounded in action, and 47 declared missing. Enemy killed in action were 869, with an undetermined amount for their wounded in action. Ironically, I later learned that the battleship USS New Jersey delivered much of the firepower and shelling in the Quantree region, where Richard's platoon operated. The New Jersey was the same battleship his uncle Joseph Ambrose Flaherty served on during World War II 25 years earlier. He lost most of his hearing due to the concussions of the main guns firing 